to the first lecture on knowledge representation. We're going to take a couple class sessions to look at chapter 12, and in this lecture we'll be looking specifically at sections 12.1 to 12.3. These are all of the topics that are covered in chapter 12 that we're going to talk about. And uh, today we'll talk about ontological engineering, categories and objects, and actions, situations, and events. And uh, these are sort of the uh, basic tools that uh, artificial intelligence practitioners uh, use uh, to represent uh, uh, the world um, uh, in a way uh, adequate enough to uh, uh, serve for proper reasoning. So let's start with ontological engineering. So the idea is to create more in general flexible representations by being able to connect uh, concepts to each other. Um, how these things relate to each other uh, uh, will help us uh, reason about them. What kinds of concepts are these? Well, they're concepts like actions that we could take, like in Wumpus World, or especially in the real world, uh, time, uh, phys some physical object, and, uh, and beliefs. And um, uh, we're going to be actually using the representation of beliefs fairly extensively uh, later on in the course. And it's probably worth pointing out at this point that there's a difference between belief and knowledge. So belief is something that I think is true, and knowledge is uh, a belief that is, in fact, true. So if I believe that uh, I am uh, talking to you uh, via this recorded lecture, uh, that is, in fact, true, assuming that you're actually listening. Um, and uh, uh, I could, and I want to distinguish that between a belief that may not be true. So, for instance, I could believe uh, that the moon is made of green cheese. I hold that belief, but it's not true. And just to uh, uh, make things a little more sophisticated, um, I could have knowledge about beliefs. So, for instance, um, uh, Mary might believe that the moon is made of green cheese. That's her belief. And I know that it is true that that is her belief, so I have knowledge of that belief. Well, we'll be using those kinds of concepts uh, towards the end of the semester. Well, next thing ontological engineering can do is to define a general framework of concepts. And in a minute, we'll look at an upper ontology. That is, it's a way of looking at things uh, that lets us organize uh, knowledge at the highest levels of abstraction. Um, I need to point out that there are lots of limits of logical representations. Uh, for instance, exceptions. So um, if we think of uh, tomatoes as being uh, round and red fruits, not to mention the controversy about whether uh, tomatoes are fruits or vegetables, but be that as it may, um, it's, even though we might define uh, tomatoes as red fruits, it's also true that there are green and yellow tomatoes, so we'll have to figure out a way to deal with those exceptions. Now, these problems are more prevalent than you might think. So, for instance, um, uh, if we define dog as a uh, furry mammal with four legs that barks, um, that's true, I guess, and it helps us understand what a dog is. But it's also true that there are whole breeds of dog, like the Basenji, uh, uh, where the dogs don't bark. And there are individual dogs um, that uh, might not have all four legs. And they're nevertheless dogs. And if, our, uh, if we can't deal with exceptions in our representation, then we're going to make mistakes when we reason about things like dogs and tomatoes. So here's that upper ontology of the world. Now, this is basically the author's idea of what 
is a reasonable organization of knowledge at its most abstract level. Um, this isn't something that's provable. It's just something that turns out to be uh, useful based on experience. And we'll see pretty quickly that uh, there are some limitations. So uh, at the most uh, abstract level, uh, there's anything, um, no matter what, anything. And we can divide that into abstract objects and generalized events, that is, things that occur. So when we look at abstract objects, we can think of them as including things like sets, numbers, and representational objects, which might include things like sentences in mathematics, or English for that matter, and measurements. And measurements could include things like time and weight and volume and so forth. Uh, generalized events, by that I mean things that occur, well, intervals in time occur, and a real short interval might be a moment. Places are things that occur, so El Paso, New York City, uh, your living room are places that occur, and physical objects occur in time and space, so uh, that includes things like things in general, which includes both animals and agents, and humans are both animals and agents, interestingly enough, and then there's stuff like solid and liquid and gas, and you might want to think about the complexities of these. So um, where does a car fit in here? Um, it could be a thing, um, but it really seems like stuff, but uh, cars contain both solids and liquids. Hmm. And, and what about an ice cube tray? So uh, when we first fill the ice cube tray, it's liquid, but then uh, uh, when we, after we put it in the freezer, it's solid. And so it's, but it's the same ice cube tray, but somehow it's two different kinds of things. So anyway, those are the kinds of problems you can have in trying to represent things at a really high level of abstraction. And in order to be able to uh, reason about these things, we'll, ha we'll, be able, we'll have to be able to do that. So that's the sort of really high level general view of how you might organize things. And um, uh, we could also create special purpose ontologies, that is, uh, uh, organization of the relationships among things for particular application domains. Now, it should be true that a general purpose ontology should be applicable in more or less any special purpose domain, that is, the relationship between uh, uh, abstractions and things and so forth, should be true regardless of whether we're talking about circuses uh, or how to make tea. Um, uh, so what we do then is basically add domain-specific axioms to the general purpose ontology and that would enable us to reason both at a high level of abstraction and at the domain-specific level of abstraction. Now, in the real world, we'll often need uh, lots of different kinds of knowledge uh, and uh, any particular domain uh, or problem uh, might uh, require uh, multiple special purpose ontologies. So if we think about the circus, um, we have to have the ontology of animals because there might be animal acts, but also those of uh, human beings and the things they can do for things like acrobats and uh, circus rings, physical objects, sawdust, um, all kinds of uh, specialized domains that would have to be unified. So. What that means is that reasoning and problem solving about some particular area would have to involve several areas simultaneously. So what do we need to express? Well, lots of things. As we've seen, we need to be able to express categories, measures, how much things are or, or how big they are, composite objects like cars, or people, too, in the sense that we're made up of organs and limbs and senses and so forth. Time, because we'll have to explain when things happen. Space, where things are and their extent. Change. Events, which are sp specific things that occur. And processes, which might be continuous 
occurrences, physical objects of all kinds, uh, substances that make up those physical objects, uh, mental objects, including beliefs. So there's a whole range of things we're going to need to be able to express in order to be able to uh, reason about things in, in the real world and provide uh, 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 proper um, uh, logical outcomes for our agents. And here we turn to uh, the issue of categories and objects. So to be able to work with objects, uh, we need to be able to generalize about them, and that means organizing objects into categories. So objects, if we respect their uh, data structure, uh, interact at the level of object, but we're going to reason about them at the level of categories, because we know about them at the category level. Um, and in fact, categories play a role in predictions about objects. Um, uh, we know how dogs behave, and we know how chairs behave, and so forth. Um, and we can also uh, 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 basically observe uh, the uh, object and then try to figure out what category it's in. And when, once we've figured out what category it's in, we can then uh, use that category to make predictions about how it behaves. So. Um, the idea is that we perceive the properties of an object that puts it in a category and then we can uh, generalize. So we can actually represent categories two different ways in first order logic. The first, and we've seen this on the exam and uh, various places, is just to define it through a predicate. So apple x means that x, whatever x is, is an apple. Or we can take the collection of objects that we consider to be apples and just bundle them into that category. And this is called reification. So re is a Latin root for thing. And so basically it's the thingification of, um, of objects. Um, so uh, basically, if we have a collection of things that we each think is an apple, we put it into a, a set, and uh, we reify that set uh, to say that it's a category called apples. So in that sense, a category can be simply defined as the set of its members. So categories relate to each other, and the relationship they use is inheritance. And this is just like uh, uh, inheritance between classes in an object-oriented programming language, like Java. So the idea is that uh, all the instances of class food, or category food, are edible. Fruit is a subclass of food, and apples is a subclass of fruit. And because apples is a subclass of fruit, and uh, fruit is a subclass of food, we know that an apple is edible. And this defines what's called a taxonomy. A taxonomy is a uh, basically a kind of uh, uh, tree uh, with of inheritance relationships. Um, it's really a network. Um, so here's an example. So uh, just a partial one. So uh, we could say, for instance, that persons, which is this uh, class here, uh, has the relationship subset of mammals. In other words, it inherits everything that's true about mammals is true about persons. But we also know about persons that persons, unlike mammals in general, have a property of having legs, and particularly they have two legs. And every person also has a mother. A person's mother is also a person, so a mother is going to be a female person, and a female person is a subset of person. And, and now, for instance, a specific female person might be Mary, and so she's a member of the class or category female persons. On the other side, we have male persons. They inherit from person. They're a subset of persons. And an instance of male persons might be a man named John, uh, who has, uh, uh, who's therefore a member of male persons. Everything is true of male persons is true of John. Everything is true of per 
of persons is true of male persons, so normally we could reason that John has two legs because persons have two legs. Um, but in fact, uh, John was in a motorcycle accident and only has one leg, and therefore for John we'll have a special exception to say that he has one leg. So that's an example of a partial taxonomy, and uh, it shows the inheritance relationships, which here we're expressing as subset of, and uh, the instance relationship, which is member of. So to uh, um, summarize this, um, an object is a member of a category. Um, and so, for example, uh, mem uh, some object BB12 is a member of the category basketballs. That's saying that there's some basketball whose name is going to be BB12 and it's an instance of basketball or basketballs. Um, a category is a subclass of another category, so it, it, it's, it, we use the subset uh, relationship. So basketballs are a subset of balls. Um, it, basketballs is not an instance of balls. Um, uh, BB12 is a specific instance of basketballs and hence an instance of balls, but basketballs is a category which inherits from balls. All members of a category have properties um, of, that, uh, of that category. So um, if X is a member of the category basketballs, then X is going to be round. And conversely, we can recognize members of a category by their properties. So for instance, um, if X is orange and round, has a diameter of 9.5 inches, and is a member of balls, then uh, we'll conclude that it's a member of basketballs. And finally, the category as a whole has some property. So, for instance, a um, uh, member of dogs, uh, dogs is a member of, of, of uh, domesticated species. So, we're talking about relations between categories. And there are a couple definitions that are useful. So we say that two or more categories of, are disjoint if they have no members in common. So for instance, um, we know that animals and vegetables are disjoint. Uh, there is no thing that is both an animal and a vegetable. Um, and we say that a set of categories S constitutes an exhaustive decomposition of some category C if all the members of the set C are covered in the categories by categories in S. In other words, um, uh, an exhaustive decomposition says that uh, these subcategories constitute all the possible subcategories of the, um, of the uh, uh, category from which they inherit. So for example, an exhaustive decomposition uh, of uh, North Americans might be Americans, Canadians, and Mexicans. That is, uh, 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 there are no other North Americans other than Americans, Canadians, and Mexicans. Next definition is partition, and that's a disjoint exhaustive decomposition. So, um, for instance, um, uh, we had this, we know that to be a North American, you had to be an American, a Canadian, or a Mexican. But is that a partition, so that it's a disjoint, exhaustive decomposition? Think about it for a minute. Is Americans, Canadian, Mexicans, North Americans a partition? Well, it might be that somebody has both Mexican citizenship and American citizenship, and therefore, um, uh, we know that, therefore, that the exhaustive decomposition of Americans, Canadians, and Mexicans uh, as subcategories of North Americans is not disjoint. And we can define categories providing necessary and sufficient conditions for membership. So, for instance, um, we could define uh, bachelor as a category as being someone who's male and adult and unmarried. Now, we have so far been looking at categories which 
uh, basically are kind of uh, legalistic definitions. They're things that people make up. Um, but a lot of categories have no clear definitions. We know who, in general, we know who an American is, we know who a Canadian is. Uh, but something like a chair, a bush, or a book um, may not have clear cut definitions. So, just for a moment, stop the video and think about um, why chair, bush, or book might be confusing. Okay, welcome back. With any luck, you thought about it. So, um, what about an ottoman? It's something you sit on, it's kind of like a chair, and what about a short stool? That's a chair, I guess. Or are stools kinds of chairs, or are they something different? Um, what about tall stools, even if they have a back on them? So that's that's not clear cut. What about bushes? Um, you know, is it if it's big enough, it's a tree, but when does that happen? Um, are uh, oleanders bushes or trees? Not you know, and books. Um, is a comic book a book? It says book in it. Um, telephone book? It doesn't seem like a normal book. Um, what about a book that's uh, a text file on a Kindle or a Nook? Is, is that a book? So, problems. And then we also talked about exceptions. Uh, so, tomatoes are sometimes green, sometimes yellow. They're even yellow and black ones. Uh, they're mostly round, but in fact, um, uh, sometimes they're not round. They're sort of flattened a little bit or whatever. So um, one solution to that is to have a category of typical tomatoes. So for all x, x belongs to the category typical tomatoes if it's red and spherical. In that case, it's sort of like an archetypal or usual tomato. And uh, the fact is that we can write down useful facts about categories without providing exact definitions. Uh, using this kind of approach. Um, what about Batchelor? It was a philosopher of language um, who challenged the utility of the notion of a strict definition. So, for instance, um, remember that Batchelor was an unmarried adult male, um, but if we have a statement like, the Pope is a Batchelor, it fits that definition, but the Pope doesn't really fit our concept of, uh, of, of who a Batchelor is. Objects can also uh, be described in terms of physical composition. One object may be part of another. So, for instance, um, uh, Bucharest is part of Romania. Uh, Romania is part of Eastern Europe, and Eastern Europe is part of Europe. Now, note that the part of predicate is transitive, but not reflexive. In other words, um, if Bucharest is part of Romania, it is not true that Romania is part of Bucharest. So we can, but because it's transitive, we can infer that uh, Bucharest is part of Europe because Bucharest is part of Romania, Romania is part of Eastern Europe, and Eastern Europe is part of Europe. More generally, for all X, part uh, 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 something is part of itself, and it's uh, uh, also transitive in general. So if X is part of Y and Y is part of Z, then X is part of Z. And um, we can often characterize things by their structural relations among parts. So, for instance, um, we can characterize something as being a biped if it has two legs and a body, and the le each leg is part of the body, and they're not the same leg, and so forth. Finally, uh, in terms of describing things, we've got measurements. So, objects have height, they have mass, they have cost, volume, and so forth. And the values that we assign to these uh, uh, characteristics are called measures. So we combine a unit function with a number. So the unit function might be length, and, uh, and the number is going to be, say, inches or centimeters. And then we can have rules that convert uh, between these units. So for all i, uh, centimeters um, uh, you know, uh, is of uh, 2.54 times i equals inches of i, and so forth. Now, it's true that some measures have no scale. So, for instance, we talk about somebody being more beautiful or less beautiful than another person, but um, other than, the, say, the movie 10, uh, in general, we don't really uh, have a scale for that. It's not like uh, uh, somebody is 6.5 Helens where Helen of Troy was the ultimate uh, 
standard of beauty, something like that. Um, difficulty, all these kinds of things have no scale. Um, the one thing we want to know about measurables, though, is that they have an order. Uh, they're orderable. So we could say that x is more beautiful than y and so forth, even if we don't know the actual number. Um, so we can, in this case, um, we can assign arbitrary values, even if there's no natural scale, we can say an apple can have a deliciousness of 0.9 or 0.1, as long as we're consistent about the way that we assign deliciousness values to our apples, and that an apple that's actually more delicious than another always has a deliciousness value that's higher than the less delicious apple. Here we're going to turn our attention to actions, events, and situations. So remember Wumpus World? Here's an example of a situation where we're starting out in square 1-1 one, one, and we're facing north and we move forward from state 0 to state 1 and the result is that our uh, Asian is now in square 1-2. This kind of reasoning about outcome of actions is central to a knowledge base agent. And that then poses the question of how we can keep track of something like location using first order logic. Now, in uh, our implementation of Wumpus World, um, many of us used uh, uh, asserts and retracts, which are really extra logical operations. And the sort of deeper issue is how are we going to be able to reason logically, uh, purely logically, not using extra logical um, uh, 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 programming tricks. So, um, what, the way to do that is by representing time by situations, which are states that result from the execution of actions. So, we can say that state S1 here is a result of executing the forward action when we were in state S0, the initial, uh, initial state. And this approach is called situation calculus. So, in situation calculus, which is a uh, way of expressing this in first order logic, actions are logical terms. And situations are logical terms consisting of the initial situation I and all situations resulting from an action in I. So, for instance, um, which would result be the result of uh, some action A in situation S. So, here in our example, uh, state S1 is the situation that results from the action A, which would be forward, on a situation S, which in this case is S0. I also want to chat about the uh, idea of a fluent. So a fluent is a function, basically a predicate, uh, that varies from one situation to the next. By that I mean it's a predicate that can be true at only specified times. So, for instance, if we think about whether our agent has the gold in hand, um, at the beginning, uh, the agent is not holding the gold. And so we can say, if we have a fluent holding gold, or holding G1 or whatever, we can say that uh, 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 in S0, the agent is not holding the gold, and that's a fluent. Um, note that that a fluent can change its value depending on what the situation is. So in some situation S sub i uh, or Sn, uh, uh, the, the agent would be holding the gold. And also there are external predicates are allowed which are eternal, uh, um, uh, not fluents. So, uh, so a fluent is true sometimes, an eternal predicate which is outside the notion of fluent, external of that, um, is, is true all the time. So, for instance, um, if we have some object that's gold, we can say gold G1 and object G1 will always be true. Now, the results of action sequences are determined by the individual actions. In other words, uh, uh, the, uh, if one situation is the result of another, uh, that situation was in turn the result of a prior situation and so forth. And going from situation to situation, 
um, uh, involves uh, going through some chain of actions. And there are two kinds of tasks about actions that, that uh, agents can do. One is a projection task. So that is, a situation calculus agent um, should be able to, given what they know about the current state, deduce the outcome of a sequence of actions. The other kind is a planning task. So that is, let's say we have a, uh, uh, a goal, we'd want to find a sequence that achieves a desirable effect. So one is sort of, the projection task goes from where we are now to figure out what would happen if we applied some sequence of actions. And a planning task is figuring out what sequence of actions would get us to a state. So, for example, if we uh, uh, are found ourselves in state uh, S1, uh, which was the result of moving forward from S0, the next action might be turn right, and that would take us to a state which was the result of turning right from the result of moving forward from the initial state. Now, let's talk a little bit about how to describe change. And situation calculus, at least in its most basic form, requires two axioms to describe change. The first is the possibility axiom. And that is, when is it possible to do the action? So for instance, um, if we know that you can only move to an adjacent square, then we have an axiom like at agent x uh, in, uh, in some state, uh, and x is adjacent to y, that implies that it's possible to go from x to y in that state s. The other axiom required by situation calculus is the effect axiom. So while the possibility axiom says, when is it possible to do an action, the effect ax axiom describes the changes that are due to that action. So for instance, if it's possible to go from x to y in state s, then doing that means that uh, the agent will be at y in the state that's the result of going from x to y from state s. One of the problems that has confronted artificial intelligence practitioners and researchers for years is called the frame problem. And that's how to represent all the things that stay the same. We know that the agent has moved, for instance, from one square to another, but it's possible the wumpus moved or we dropped something, whatever. Uh, so the frame problem is how to represent all the things that stay the same. And we don't really want to uh, have to, in each situation, uh, list, again, all the things that are true, because otherwise our situations would be huge. So to get around the frame problem, we use something called a frame axiom. And the frame axiom describes non-changes due to actions. So for instance, if we have a, a, a predicate uh, at uh, um, some agent O, uh, some, something object um, uh, is at X in state S, and O is not the agent, and O uh, um, and the uh, agent isn't holding O in state S, then we know that um, uh, uh, O, the object O, will still be at X in the state that results from the agent going from Y to Z um, uh, out of state S. In other words, it says that in other words, it says that if something isn't the agent, um, that isn't going to move even if the agent moves. That's a frame axiom. There are other problems about representation of frames. So let's say we have F fluence. And remember, fluence are uh, predicates which are true at certain times and false at other times. And we have a number of actions. Then we're going to need a times f frame axioms to describe all the other objects that are stationary unless they are held. 
and that means we have to write down the effect of each action. That's a lot of frame axioms. So what's the solution? Well, we describe how each fluent changes over time, and that's called a successor state axiom. So the idea is that if we know that the position of A in state S implies that uh, agent, uh, the agent is at Y as a result of AS, that's the same as saying that uh, A, the action A is go to uh, from X to Y or uh, that agent um, is at Y in state S and uh, A, the action is not go uh, from Y to Z. So in other words, um, what we explain with a successor state axiom is the change in the fluent over time based on what the agent does. Now, we note that the next state is completely specified by the current state, which means that we don't have to add extra things. And what's more, each action effect is mentioned only once, uh, so there's no possibility of confusion. Finally, I want to talk about other problems in representation of actions and events. So one of the problems is dealing with secondary or implicit effects. So it's common sense that if we're holding the gold, the gold is going to go with us. But the problem is we need to represent that. And so um, uh, that's called the ramification problem. And so uh, basically we need to understand what the ramifications of our actions are so we can represent in the next state uh, or via a representation of fluence um, what the, these implications are. Um, now, one way to do it would just be to write, write them all down every time we took an action, but that's not very efficient. And um, the real problem is how to decide efficiently whether a fluent holds in some future state and that's called the inferential frame problem. And finally, um, there are extensions of situation calculus. Uh, the primary one is called event calculus, and that's when actions have a duration. It's not just that we instantaneously move from one location to another, but that this very process of movement or picking up the goal or whatever has, has some kind of a, a duration. And then finally, we can extend it via process categories uh, where we can generalize about kinds of actions so that we don't have to specify the same uh, outcomes for every, every kind of action in the category. We can uh, um, uh, understand that it's an action of a certain kind of category, and as a result, certain things happen as a result. So that's a little bit about uh, representation, and especially with respect to uh, actions um, and events and uh, we'll uh, start to solve some of those problems involving these ideas in the next